Welcome to the latest episode of British History, Royals, Rebels, and Romantics, the podcast for people who understand that history shows us what's possible for us in our lives today. I'm Carol Ann Lloyd, your host and tour guide as we travel back in time. We're shaking up history to look at the stories that don't always make the history books, to consider famous and infamous characters in new and interesting ways, and to look for all the things that we share even when we're living in different times and places. I hope you enjoy this journey through the royals, rebels, and romantics of Britain. Now, let's explore history together. The Tudor dynasty was not your average dynasty. For one thing, the so-called dynasty lasted just three generations and 118 years. It started with a power grab. It saw a staggering number of executions. It thrust England into years of religious chaos. The wars in France fought over this period were expensive and ultimately disastrous. There were periods of crop failure, economic collapse, poverty, and hunger. The safety net of religious support was eliminated as the monasteries were dissolved and the funds recovered went to the crown. And it included two crowned queens, first time in history, and one uncrowned but proclaimed queen, also one of a kind. It included a stunning naval victory over the famed Spanish Armada. It saw the establishment of the first permanent playhouse and the works of great English playwrights and poets, including Christopher Marlowe, Thomas Kidd, Francis Beaumont, John Fletcher, Thomas Middleton, Sir Philip Sidney, and, of course, William Shakespeare. It also saw the first book published by a queen. Dickens might have called it the best of times and the worst of times. It was also a time of scandal. That's what we'll be looking at for the next couple of episodes. Considering this dynasty includes a king who might have been legally barred from taking the throne, a king who managed to get married more times than any other monarch in English history, two queens executed by the command of their royal husband, a contested succession, two extreme shifts in the politics of religious observance, and only one normal transfer of power from father to adult son, there are plenty of scandals to explore. So buckle up, because here we go. How do we get started? The first tutor is just about the least likely guy in history to grow up, win a battle, grab a crown, marry a princess, and start a new dynasty. Henry Tudor was the first and only son of Margaret Beaufort and Edmund Tudor. His father was the half-brother of King Henry VI. When Henry V died, Catherine of Valois married Owen Tudor and had some sons. The oldest of these was Edmund, who married 12-year-old Margaret Beaufort in 1455. Edmund died of the plague as a prisoner of the Yorkist forces a year later, leaving Margaret a 13-year-old widow and pregnant. Edmund's brother Jasper took in his young sister-in-law, and Henry Tudor was born 28 January, 1457. It's surprising he or Margaret survived, but they did. Even so, a 13-year-old widow and a baby on the losing side of the Wars of the Roses doesn't sound like the best beginning for a king. Henry grew up largely on the run or in exile. His mother was a descendant of John of Gaunt, so Henry had royal blood, but from the wrong sides of the sheets, so to speak. John of Gaunt had a long affair with Catherine Swinford, and they had several children together. Margaret, and therefore Henry, descended from that relationship. John of Gaunt eventually married Catherine, and the children were made retroactively legitimate. But in a day when birth origins were critical to perceived value, Henry's claim was suspect. Additionally, there was an addendum to the order that made the Beaufort family legitimate heirs. Apparently, in the reign of Henry IV, a note was added that the Beaufort line cannot inherit the throne. It's not clear exactly when this was added or whether any action was taken to make it a legal part of the agreement. Historian Nathan Amin maintains it's probably not legal, but it did create the impression that the Beauforts could not take the throne. This reinforced suspicion of Henry's claim. During the reign of Richard III, 
Lancastrian supporters and some York Yorkists who were opposed to Richard taking the throne came over to Henry's side. His mother apparently negotiated with Elizabeth Woodville, mother of the princes in the tower, that Henry return to England, marry her daughter Elizabeth of York, and take the throne. It was a long shot, but worth a go. Henry gathered up support from England, hired some French mercenaries, and headed for the coast. Henry and his forces met Richard III and his forces at Bosworth Field. Astonishingly, Henry won. According to legend, after Henry's victory on 22 August 1485, he was crowned right there on the field. Still, not your typical way of becoming a king, right? Henry scheduled an elaborate official coronation for himself, 30 October 1485, with all the pomp and ceremony you can imagine. He was styled Henry, by the grace of God, King of England and France, and Lord of Ireland. He held his first parliament starting November 7th, where he arranged the records would indicate that his reign started on 21 August, the day before the Battle of Bosworth. This meant he was already king on the battlefield, and Richard III was the one who was fighting against the monarch. Talk about rewriting history. Henry Tudor married Elizabeth of York on 18 January 1486. Henry considered this the final act of the Wars of the Roses, uniting York and Lancaster through marriage. The Tudor Rose was the symbol of this union and the symbol of the dynasty. Then, eight months after the marriage, a baby joined the family, and it was a boy. Prince Arthur was born at Winchester, the spot associated with the legend of King Arthur. And now that she'd given him a son, Henry fulfilled the final part of his promise by having Elizabeth of York crowned on 25 November 1487, just about two years after his own coronation. Henry Tudor was pulling out all the stops in establishing the dynasty, associating it with King Arthur, grand celebrations, and rewritten history. The first Tudor king had managed to take the throne and create a narrative that launched the dynasty. He wasn't always bound by truth, and he tended to overlook awkward realities, like the possible ban of the Beauforts, or that he was not actually the king the day before the Battle of Bosworth. The symbol of the dynasty, the Tudor Rose, is a symbol of Henry rewriting history. His reducing the complicated dynamics of the battles for the crown into a simple family feud. But it worked. Henry VII put down rebellions, held on to his crown, had two sons and two daughters who survived childhood, managed to get recognition from Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain, who agreed their daughter could marry the Tudor heir. Some scandals along the way, certainly, but we're off to a good start. Catherine of Aragon. To get the dynasty going, Henry VII finalized the arrangements for Catherine of Aragon to come and marry Prince Arthur. Here's a bit of trivia that could have caused a scandal. Catherine of Aragon was a great great granddaughter of John of Gaunt through his first wife, Blanche of Lancaster. So she actually had a stronger claim to the English throne than any of the Tudors. Seriously, how did the Tudor tabloids miss that? Catherine left for England on 17 August 1501 and met Arthur on 4 November when he rode to greet her entourage at Dover. They were married with a huge ceremony and celebration on 14 November 1501, with Arthur's young brother, Henry, escorting Catherine along the procession and stealing the show with his dancing. Foreshadowing. Okay, then comes the wedding night, which ends up leading to one of the biggest scandals of the dynasty. The young bride and groom were publicly put to bed, as was the custom of the time. Then everyone left. People might have hung around and listened at the door. We don't know. What should have been a private moment became the question of the dynasty. Did they or didn't they? Supposedly, Arthur did a bit of boasting to his buddies, but stack that up against the word of a woman known for her devotion to God and strict practice of religion, who maintained before her husband, a full court, her confessor, and anyone who would listen, that she and Arthur did not consummate the marriage. Who do you believe? A bragging teenager or one of the most devout women of the time. Unfortunately, shortly after the marriage, disaster struck. The young prince was taken ill, 
possibly of the sweating sickness, and died on 2nd of April, 1502. Catherine, just 16 years old, was sick as well but recovered. In less than six months, she had gone from being a new bride and princess to a young widow, and things were going to get worse. Henry VII and Ferdinand spent years bickering over what to do with Catherine now that Arthur was dead. There was a chance Catherine could marry the new heir, Prince Henry. Henry VII was insisting that Ferdinand cough up the rest of Catherine's dowry, and Ferdinand was not playing ball. So the betrothal became a pressure point. Your daughter can still be Queen of England if you pay up. In any case, the kings decided to get permission from the Pope so Catherine could marry Henry. The papal dispensation included a phrase that the marriage between Catherine and Arthur had perhaps been consummated. Catherine's parents believed Catherine, who was already maintaining nothing happened between her and Arthur, but Henry VII wanted to cover all the bases. Henry VII died on the 21st of April, 1509, and Henry VIII wasted no time marrying Catherine in a quiet ceremony on the 11th of June. Then, on Midsummer Day, Sunday, 24th of June, 1509, Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon were crowned together by the Archbishop of Canterbury and Westminster Abbey. Fast forward to the mid-1520s. Henry had been on the throne for more than 15 years and had no son to follow him. Catherine was by now unable to have more children and had only produced one daughter, Princess Mary. Henry felt he needed to make a move. Enter Anne Boleyn. Henry describes himself as struck with the dart of love. He certainly seemed struck with something. Acting like a schoolboy, Henry pursued Anne with a reckless abandon that shocked his court. He was determined to have her. Since she refused to become his mistress, he would make her his wife. Of course, that meant he had to do something about the wife he already had. Hey, was it right for him to have married his brother's widow? No! That's why God had not given him a son. The Pope had been wrong to grant the dispensation. The marriage to Catherine was invalid. That was Henry's thinking. But Catherine maintained still that the marriage to Arthur was not consummated. Therefore, she was legally married to Henry. Despite pressure, shouting, begging, and even convening a court, Henry was unable to convince Catherine to just let him out of the marriage. The king's great matter, as it was called, consumed English politics at home and abroad for years. Unable to make the divorce happen, longtime counselor Cardinal Wolsey fell from favor. Catherine was banished from court. Henry and the court were tipped toward religious reform by Anne Boleyn, her followers, and her family chaplain, Thomas Cranmer, who became Archbishop of Canterbury. Eventually deciding that English law was up to the English king and not the Pope, Henry married Anne Boleyn secretly in late 1532 or early 1533. Archbishop Cranmer declared Henry's marriage to Catherine of Aragon invalid and his marriage to Anne Boleyn valid in May of 1533. Anne Boleyn, already visibly pregnant, was crowned Queen of England on the 1st of June, 1533. Catherine did not go quietly. She continued to keep her scandal alive by maintaining that she was the true Queen of England, anointed by God's servants. She was popular with the people. Her death in January of 1536 marked the beginning of a year that would see two queens die and three different women be called Queen of England, and more marital misadventures were to come. Henry VIII starts the marriage marathon. Of course, for Henry, this was only the beginning. He embarked on a marriage marathon that would outpace any other king of England. This was scandalous for a few reasons. First, Henry seems to have completely ignored the memo about what royal marriages were supposed to be like at this stage of the history game. His parents' marriage was a good example. They were married to resolve a dynastic conflict. Arthur and Catherine were married to establish a relationship with an important foreign power. Henry's sister Margaret's marriage to the King of Scotland was made in hopes of getting a better relationship going there. Henry's marriage to Catherine of Aragon might partly have been to gain a father-in-law who would be a likely partner against the French, but it was also about knowing and really liking Catherine personally. That's what mattered to Henry. From then on, it was all about the personal for him. The 
only completely political marriage in Henry's history was the one of Anne, with Anne of Cleves. And why did that fall apart? Because they didn't click personally. Henry remembered how much fun he used to have dressing up as Robin Hood and surprising Catherine of Aragon and later Anne Boleyn. Somehow, these women managed to both be taken in by the king's cleverness and recognize his royal presence and inner kingliness despite the disguise. They played the game. Anne of Cleves didn't even know the rules. When Henry was dressed as a lowly messenger, she thought he was a lowly messenger. No recognition of cleverness or kingliness. That was a personal rejection to Henry, and that doomed the marriage before it began. Henry expected marriage to make him happy, and that's not the way diplomatic political marriages worked. Kings were expected to marry to bring in wealth and prestige from another country, and then to beget heirs with a wife and find happiness quietly wherever else. But Henry's immediate history had taught him something different. Although made for political reasons, his parents' marriage had become a warm, devoted relationship. There are no tales of Henry VII having mistresses, despite that being the norm for kings at the time. Descriptions of Henry VII and Elizabeth comforting each other after Arthur's death are heartwarming. And Henry VII was devastated by his wife's death, cutting himself off from the world for more than a month. Young Henry VIII apparently picked up on the being happy part and missed the part about taking care of each other and being faithful. In any case, once he started the process by marrying Anne Boleyn and then officially ending the marriage to Catherine of Aragon, he got on a roll. Three years later, Anne Boleyn was in the tower awaiting her execution while he made final plans with Jane Seymour. One day after he cut off Anne's head, he became engaged to Jane Seymour, and ten days later they were married. May 1536 was a busy one for Henry. Of course, Henry would have avoided Jane's death if he could. Some people point to the space of more than two years between Jane's death and Henry's next marriage as a sign he was really mourning her. Well, he might have been mourning her, but he was already looking for a few a new wife just a few weeks after Jane's death. Turns out, with three wives dead, it took a bit of doing to find the fourth. And while he was married unhappily to Anne of Cleves, word got out he was trying to move on again. When King Francis I was told that Henry was looking to end his fourth marriage, the French king responded with surprise, with the queen that now is? Yes, indeed. In fact, after marrying Anne of Cleves in January of 1540, Henry successfully ended that marriage in time to marry Catherine Howard in July of that year. Henry was rocked by Catherine's betrayal, which included not telling him about her early experiences with men and possibly intending to sleep with Thomas Culpepper. This, again, is personal. He had convinced himself that Catherine Howard was his alone. It took him more than a year to wed again after her death, this time to the twice-widowed Catherine Parr. Overall, that was a successful match. Although there was an attempted coup by Catholics who were concerned about Catherine Parr's commitment to religious reform. In the end, Catherine learned of the plot and reconciled with the king, leaving him angry with his ministers instead of with her. She managed to hang on and was married to Henry until he died on the 28th of January, 1547. In the last 11 years of his life, from January 1536 to January 1547, Henry had been married to Catherine of Aragon, according to her, until her death, Anne Boleyn, until her execution in May, Jane Seymour, until her death in 1537, Anne of Cleves, until their marriage was annulled six months after it started in 1540, Catherine Howard, until her execution in 1542, and Catherine Parr. Six wives in 11 years. What a scandal. Several Tudor scandals, and we're not finished yet. Thank you for joining me to get us started with the scandals that shook up Tudor England. Join us next week as the scandals continue into the next three reigns, Edward VI, Mary I, and Elizabeth. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please share with a friend. Do send any questions or comments. I'd love to hear from you where we should explore next. And please subscribe and leave a review. I'd really appreciate it. I'm so glad we could explore history together. Till next time. Thank you.